everyone. So for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at Korea, Cuba, and Berlin. Basically, these are situations in which the Cold War almost came to full-on war, or actually was a war, but it wasn't a direct conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States. In a lot of ways, these were proxy conflicts. That is, they were conflicts that were fought between communism and democracy between these two superpowers, but the two superpowers did not go to war directly. You kind of see that in this cartoon here. Both of these nuclear powers didn't want to go to war because of the threat of nuclear war, but they ended up fighting throughout the world in different ways. So why would the United States get involved in a war with Korea, in a conflict over Berlin, and in a conflict over Cuba? You'd have to think about why would they care? Who really would care about that? Um, the U.S. would not have cared about Korea or Cuba in previous years. These are small, often unimportant nations. But what happens is the Cold War made them important. Remember that idea of the spread of communism? What happens is that this is a global conflict. This conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union spanned the globe. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, the U.S. saw an attack on any country as a threat to America. The containment doctrine demanded a U.S. response. So what the United States is trying to do is to contain the spread of communism. You can see that here in this depiction um, in the cartoon of the Russian bear and the USSR spreading communist, communism throughout the world. So the idea is that the United States has to stop this. So any country, whether it's small, insignificant country, the idea of them turning to communism is seen as a direct threat to the United States. So let's first look at Korea. Korea was a divided country. North and South Korea had been one nation before World War II. The Japanese had invaded Korea and occupied it, but at the end of World War II, Soviet troops liberated and occupied the northern part of the country, North Korea. Allied forces freed South Korea. What this did was create a division that remained in the years after the war. So in 1950, from the United States point of view, the bad guys start a fight. The communist North Korean regime attacked its neighbor South Korea in 1950. Um, they were trying to unite the peninsula, create a single country as it had been. But the United, St United States and the United Nations forces stepped in to save South Korea. Um, they consider this a police action. They were defending South Korea, defending South Korean sovereignty against North Korean communist aggression. So following this police action, the United States and the UN forces stopped the communist advance. What happens then from the US perspective is the good guys counterattack. The allied forces counterattacked and drove deep into North Korean territory. So remember North Korea invaded South Korea, US and UN forces come in and beat them back and push them all the way back to the Chinese border. The North Korean forces were then aided by Chinese forces. So the Chinese forces joined the war and attacked allied forces. So this is seen from the United States as bad guys fighting back. As a result of this, General MacArthur, who was leading the forces, remember General MacArthur from World War II in the Philippines, leading the um, forces in the Pacific, he was leading the forces in the Korean War. General MacArthur wanted to use nuclear weapons against the Chinese forces, basically to destroy them in the field. Um, President Truman removed him from command because of the suggestion. He did not want to use nuclear weapons again, as we saw the destruction in Japan. Uh, but MacArthur, like many military minds, just saw this as another tool. Um, but what happens is the Chinese and the North Korean forces are able to push the U.S. and the U.N. forces back to retreat to the 38th parallel. So the result of the Korean War is actually a stalemate. So after the forces, the Chinese, North Korean forces pushed the U.S. and the U.N. back to the 38th parallel, this is kind of where the front line stabilized at that 38th parallel. You can see that in this armistice line there. Um, and what happens is both sides agree to a ceasefire. So that is they're going to quit firing each other, quit killing each other, and that goes into effect. But that is not officially in the war. So this is actually how it is today. Um, there is a ceasefire, but there has never been an official end of the war. The UN and North Korean troops continue to arm the border. Here is a picture from the 38th parallel. You can see on the far side, there's North Korean troops marching along. On the other side, near 
us in this picture are UN troops, South Korean troops that are on the South Korean side. So that is literally the border between North and South Korea. It is armed. There are troops on each side. Um, each side has massive armaments pointed at each other. Um, and so that's what's so scary about the Korean conflict going forward is that there's actually never been an end to that war. That it was just a stalemate and it ended right there, splitting the splitting Korea between the North and the South. So the ceasefire began in July of 1953 and has lasted until today. And this has created a permanent split on the Korean peninsula. You have the North Korean country, which is a communist dictatorship. Then you have South Korea, which is a capitalist democracy and is free from of communist occupation. So you see a split between the two sides of the Cold War, communist versus democracy on the Korean Peninsula. Nothing sums up the differences between these two countries than this photo of a night image of a satellite image. Um, what you can see here is the line along the 38th parallel there separating the two countries. You can see above that is North Korea. You can see there's only one small area with light. That's Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. The rest of it is mountainous, um, is not developed, and North Korea is one of the poorest countries in the world. Below that 38th parallel, you can see South Korea lit up, full of lights. South Korea's economy has grown vastly since the Korean War um, and has created a lot of wealth in there. Um, they are a functioning democracy. And so what you can see here is kind of the drastic difference between a communist dictatorship and a capitalist democracy. And see how um, the differences in the Cold War affected the people. Communist North Korea is a totalitarian state. The Kim family runs the state. Kim Il-sung founded the state of North Korea, was the communist leader in the founding of the North Korean state. Um, his grandson, pictured there, Kim, um, Kim Jong-un, is now the leader of the regime and basically the they control everything they are worshipped as gods they control all of life in north korea as a result of this totalitarian communist state north koreans live in extreme poverty you can see that depiction of that satellite image think about just lights at night you can see here north korean kids living in poverty at the same time the capitalist democratic south korea is a bustling multicultural world hub. Seoul, South Korea is one of the financial hubs of the world. Um, there is a mass amount of entertainment that comes out of South Korea. There's a mass amount of business um, and it is a thriving society. So think before World War II, this is the same country, but then you see that split in the Korean War between communist dictatorship and capitalist democratic society. And you can see the difference in prosperity between those two. Let's now take a look at Cuba. Cuba is, Cuba is an island about 90 miles south of Florida. In the 1950s, Fidel Castro, pictured there, led a communist revolution to overthrow the government of Cuba. Thousands of Cubans fled the country and took refuge in Florida. So obviously the United States wanted to stop the spread of communism, but to have a communist state so close to the country was even more dangerous in their eyes. So what happens is the United States begins to make preparations to try to overthrow Fidel Castro. So what they do is the CIA equipped and trained refugees, which had led, which had left Cuba and come to the United States, had trained them for an attack on Castro. What happens is known as the Bay of Pigs invasion and is a disastrous failure. Basically, these trained Cubans land on a beach and are easily overrun by Cuban forces and it exposes the failures of American power. But it also makes Castro feel fearful. He understands that the United States wants to overthrow him, that the United States will not accept a communist country in its backyard. So Cuba turns to the Soviet Union for protection. Here you have a picture of Fidel Castro and Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union. Um, so what Castro is doing is going to this other superpower in the world and saying, the United States doesn't like us, be on our side, Soviet Union, we're communist. So what does the Soviet Union do? The Soviet Union, in order to defend Cuba, stations nuclear missiles in Cuba in 1962. 
So what this means is any attack on Cuba could lead to a nuclear strike on the United States. This is basically putting weapons of mass destruction in the United States backyard. So at this point, the United States and the Soviet Union do not have diplomatic ties. They don't talk to each other. So it's not like the Soviet Union goes and says, hey, we're putting nukes in Cuba. What happens is in flying over, flying spy planes over Cuba, the United States takes a picture like one scene here from 1962, which shows a medium range ballistic missile site. So you can see here the missile ready tent, launch positions, um, locations of missile tents, fuel containers. So the idea here is that American spy planes spot areas for the launch of nuclear missiles. This is a severe threat to the United States. You can see this depiction here of those medium range ballistic missiles could reach Washington DC, reach Dallas, um, pretty much hit all of that lower Eastern seaboard there. Um, so a surprise attack could destroy the United States. You can see the long range ballistic missile there could reach almost all of the country. So the idea of having missiles in Cuba is a severe threat to the United States. This is what leads to what is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the closest that the Soviet Union and the United States ever got to war or to nuclear war. President John F. Kennedy ordered the USSR to remove the missiles and they launched a naval blockade of the island to stop incoming Soviet ships. So what happens is Kennedy sends the Navy out to stop Soviets from bringing any more in, but there are already missiles in Cuba. So at any time, those missiles could be launched in the United States. Uh, and obviously the United States would retaliate. So this is really the war, um, the world at the brink of nuclear war. So this is really close to coming to war at any moment it could happen. American and Soviet fleets faced each other off the coast of Cuba. So you think Soviets are trying to send in goods to Cuba to protect Cuba? The United States Navy is there to stop them. An action by either side would likely lead to nuclear war. So think if the United States bombs a Soviet vessel, would the Soviets respond by launching their nuclear weapons into the United States? Um, so this could really be a slippery slope to war. And you have to think how scary this is for the people in the United States, that any moment there could be a launch of nuclear weapons from Cuba. So you have people who are promoting the idea that we need to come to some negotiation with the Soviet Union, with the Cubans, um, to not lead to nuclear war. And so you have this picture here of people striking, people protesting. They said dead men can't negotiate. President Kennedy, be careful. Um, so we want peace. We do not want to be in a nuclear war. After 13 long days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviets blinked. The Soviets, the Soviet Union blinked and agreed to withdraw its missiles from Cuba. This averted nuclear war at the last second. Remember, tensions are growing. There's a blockade. At any moment, war could break out. But what happens is the Soviet Union, under pressure from the United States, under the blockade, um, says, yes, we will remove the missiles from Cuba. Lastly, let's look at the Berlin Wall. Uh, we talked about in our last lecture a little bit about the Berlin blockade, how the Soviet Union had occupied all of Berlin and how the United States used the Berlin airlift to drop supplies into Berlin to help out people um, in that city against communist um, oppression. But what happens in Berlin is that there's a wall built between East Berlin and West Berlin. So East Berlin is the Soviet Union, the East German communist side, and West Berlin is democratic and uh, an ally of the United States. But again, this is a single city that is split in two. So you have to think families are split apart. Think about where we live today. Do you live right next to your family? You might live on the other side of town. But think about if there's a wall built right down the middle of the city that you cannot get across. This really left life divided. People were split. You can see here a lady doing laundry on one side of the wall and kids playing on another side of the wall. Think about the city is just split. And it's such a drastic idea between democratic and communist that that is really what it comes down to, that, that there is a split between these two and that life is divided. 
people tried all sorts of methods to try to escape East Germany. The idea is they're living under a repressive regime. They're trying to get to the other side um, to get to a freer society in West Germany. Um, but the East German authorities did not let people defect. So over 5,000 people did escape, but over 1,000 people died trying to escape trying to get over the wall, trying to get to the other side. Um, people came up with really elaborate ways to try to escape. They include zip lines, hot air balloons, tunnels, and really short cars to try to go under the wall in areas. Um, so there's some really elaborate ideas of how to try to escape, but it's also you can see the desperation of people. They're coming up with all these ways to try to get out of the communist dictatorship. So you can really see the split between the communist world and the democratic world between the Soviet Union way of life and the United States. Um, and this is really where we see the Cold War fought are these areas throughout the world in Korea, in Cuba, and in Berlin.